Well, hey everyone, welcome to Church Online and thanks so much for joining us today. For those of you who've joined us for in-person gatherings, it's been so, so good to see you in person. And we're gonna continue to bring you the online church experience at home. We've been saying over the last few months that as a church, we may feel socially distant, but we are spiritually connected. And I don't know about you, but for me, it's been really easy to feel disconnected from others right now. And so I just want us to take a moment to bring us together, to help us feel a little bit more connected to one another. The one conviction that unites us as a church is that Jesus is for everyone. He's risen from the dead and he's made it possible for everyone, everyone to have a relationship with God. So let's read a scripture together that illuminates that conviction. This passage comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The words are going to be on your screen. And so let's read it out loud together. Here we go. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. All this from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Let's pray together. God, we just thank you that you came down to this earth uh, and you restored, you reconciled that broken relationship between us and God, a gift that we couldn't give ourselves. And so we are so grateful for that. Help us to be messengers or dispensers of your reconciliation here on earth. And God, in this season, please, please give us peace, give us unity in our world. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks again for being with us today. And thank you so much for your continued giving and support for what God is doing through this church. Your giving allows us to share the good news that Jesus is for everyone. And more than ever, that message needs to be heard right now in our world. If you're in a place to give, please go to crb.gives. Well, next up, we're going to head into a time of worship before Mike Foster shares today's message. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the church at Rancho Bernardo. Thanks for tuning in with us online. My name's DJ. Uh, we're Garden Music. We're going to sing together and worship this morning. Thanks for being with us. Side. 
is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like Hey everybody, my name is Mike Foster. I'm part of the teaching team here at CRB. I'm so glad you're joining us. We are gonna talk today about emotions. Now, I realize this isn't very applicable or relevant to your life, I'm sure these days, but it might be helpful to some other people or the people that are sitting next to you right now watching this, because emotions are all over the place, aren't they? We're, a lot of us feel frustrated, a lot of us feel angry, a lot of us feel worry. And so I wanna to look today at how do we handle our emotions? What do we do with our emotions? What's a healthy way to process emotions? And really, I wanna give you two distinct ways of handling your emotions by looking at the way Jesus handled his emotions. And, and we're gonna walk away, I believe, at the end of this, our time together, just with the ability to process and have emotional fitness and emotional health in a way that we've never had before. And I want to talk, tell you kind of just a story, begin with, with a story that happened to me this week. So I've got an 18 year old uh, daughter who lives in our house. She just graduated from high school, summer vacation is on, and I felt some emotions this week, but they weren't great emotions. They were uh, parenting emotions. So it was about 10.30 in the morning. I knock on my daughter's door and say, hey, time to get up. Why don't you start cleaning your room, make your bed? Sure, dad. All right. Come back about 15 minutes later, knock on the door again. So, hey, time to get up. You're still in bed, I see. Room's still not clean. Hey, it'd be great if you could clean your, clean your room and get started with this. All right, dad, she continues to lay in bed. I come back, you know, 30 minutes or so later, knock on the door, still in bed, no room clean, no bed made. And now I'm getting a little frustrated. Parents, am I preaching your, your truth right now? I think I am. It's like, I'm like, okay, I've, this is the third time I've asked. I really need you to get up now, okay? It's almost lunchtime. All right, you need to get up. I know it's summer, but you need to get up and you need to do what I asked you to do. And then I come, I leave, I come back the fourth time. Guess what I discover? No room clean, no bed made. My daughter in the exact same position she was when I first asked her to get up and get out of bed. And now I am not feeling lovey-dovey feelings in my soul. No, I am not feeling like this moments of joy, like thank God it's summer vacation. No, what I am feeling is absolute 
outrage and anger that my daughter is completely ignoring her father and, and shining me on. And so at parenting, right? We feel a lot of emotions and they run the gamut of excitement, joy, um, you know, celebration to get this kid out of my house right now. Out, 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 <laughs> and just trying to keep our cool. So the reality of emotions, they are everywhere. We watch the news, we see emotion. We see emotion with the protests on the streets. We see frustration with quarantine rules. We see worry about the stock market and our jobs and our future. There is just emotion everywhere. And so talking about this and realizing number one, that, that there's, there's no bad emotions. Emotions are important. The problem is, what do we do with them, right? Most of us kind of take, take this approach. We just kind of have a uh, emoji approach where we just kind of sort of talk about emotions in very simplistic ways. You know, we use a lot of emojis. By the way, do you know that, that this emoji right here is the number one uh, used emoji in our texts, in our Instagrams, in our Snapchats, right there, crying, crying tears of joy. That's what they call that uh, emoji. The second most popular one is this one. And I think a lot of us have probably been using this, this emotion or this emoji to, uh, to represent the emotion of just tears. Oh my gosh. Oh. Here's my favorite emoji that I use a lot. Worry. I, he, he's in all my, like, so I have a friend who goes, hey, I'm quitting my corporate job and I'm gonna open up a, a cat t-shirt business. I, I text him back the, the worry face. Or my wife texts me, says, hey, uh, the credit card bill came today. Uh, I text back the worry face. <laughs> um, you know, a friend texts me, hey, great news, Mike. Um, the girl I've been dating for three months, we're getting married next week. And like, <gasps> worry emoji face, right? Th this is typically how we approach emotions. Very shallow, not very deep. But Jesus approached emotions saying that they are really, really important. And he gave dignity to all emotions. In fact, we know that Jesus brings dignity to all emotions. Why? Because Jesus wept to validate our tears and Jesus mourned to validate our sadness. And Jesus sweat blood in the garden of Gethsemane to validate stress. See, here's, here's the big thing we gotta get, get our arms around in terms of emotions. There isn't anything you can feel that Jesus hasn't known. In fact, whatever emotions, worry, stress, even fear, joy, whatever the emotion might be, frustration, all of that is part of our experience as human beings and all of it Jesus has felt. He knows your feelings. He has experienced and he gives dignity to all of it. The Bible says this, it says in Romans 12, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Whatever is happening in our society, whatever is happening in our heart, whatever is happening between you and your, your a relationship you're in, whatever, your, your spouse, like we are supposed to experience those emotions, not hide them or dismiss them or think that they're not important. See, emotions give us so much great data about what's going on on the inside. And it allows us to be informed about what we should be do then doing on the outside. Now, interesting thought, uh, interesting idea is that the word emotion is actually not found in the Bible. Who knew, right? Emotion is not in the Bible, but there is a word that, that represents emotion. It's the Hebrew word, kilia. Kilia. And throughout the Old Testament, we see this word kilia representing emotions and feelings. In fact, kilia is the Hebrew word for kidney and is a metaphor that represents the heart, mind, and emotions. And so even though the Bible doesn't really address specifically emotions or that word, it does through this concept and this metaphor of kilia. And kilia is really... So think about the kidneys. Okay, the kidneys uh, are filtering different things in our bodies, right? The kidneys, also on top of the kidneys, is the adrenal glands. 
And the adrenal glands, you know, when we get scared or when we get uh, uh, frightened or whenever we get worried, man, all of a sudden those adrenal glands get kicked in, right? They start producing adrenaline in our body. It, it raises our blood pressure, our, our, fl- our face becomes flushed. It, we start reacting and it's all happening there within the kidneys. And so we have this word kilia and it, and it, it shows up several times in the, in the Old Testament. For example, in Proverbs 23, it says this, my inmost being, really the word here is kilia, will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. And in Psalm 26, it says this, it says, prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my what? My kilia, my heart and my mind. Right there, even though it says heart, mind, really the, the, the Hebrew word is kilia. Again, those kidneys representing emotions and feelings. And then finally, in Psalm 16, it says, I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also my heart or kilia instructs me. And so we have kilia in the Bible talking about kilia and, and this kidneys and emotions and feelings. But we, you know, today use the word emotion. And the word emotion comes from a French word. But, but, but really the root of the word emotion is the word to move, okay? Motion, it's right there in the word, emotion, to move. And the problem, when our, the problem with our emotions and the problem that we get, uh, kind of tangled up in and, and why our lives kind of become dominated by emotions or controlled by emotions is because we're not allowing our emotions to move. See, we're supposed to like experience something and feel something and then let it discharge, let it move out of us. But a lot of us do this. We're either blockers or we're bottlers. And so let me, let me talk about two. And, and I want you to think about it as you're sitting there, think like, am I a blocker? Or am I a bottler? And a blocker does this. It's like, I don't want to feel anything. I don't want to feel any emotions. And so I'm just going to keep all bad emotions, all good emotions out. Or I'm going to block out these certain emotions. I'll welcome these emotions. And and that's sort of our strategy for dealing with uh, the emotions of our lives. And so we're, we're blocking it, right? Now, some of you, so you're going, yep, that's me. I'm a blocker. A lot of men do a really great job blocking emotions like, oh, I'm just don't want to feel. Okay. A lot of us take that approach. Bad strategy, by the way. Okay. Because emotions are meant to move through uh, into us and through us. Now, some of us are bottlers. Bottlers are going to take those emotions and we're going to bottle it up inside of us, not allow it to release. In fact, do you know that the physiological, biological lifespan of an emotion is 90 seconds, okay? That's actually how long an emotion physiologically should stay within you before it is released or discharged. But what do we do as bottlers? We bottle it all up. We we hold on to it. And you know what the biggest culprit is? Is probably anger. We take, we're angry about something. We're frustrated about something. And so we put a little bottle inside of our heart and we just hold it until we can't hold it any longer. Uh, listen, and it comes exploding out or it, 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 it damages our heart and our happiness. It feels heavy. So we need to allow emotions to move through us. Here's what I, I've discovered. And, and you know, I'm a counselor. I work with a lot of people. We have to feel our emotions. Why? Because if you can't, if you can't, you can't heal it if you don't feel it. Right, so you got to feel that stuff. Don't bottle it. Don't block it. Here's all, the other thing that I found when working with people is that uh, bottlers eventually bust open. Now, recently, my my wife and I we we lost our dog, and he was a precious, beautiful, wonderful dog. His name was Napoleon. He was with us for 12 years, and, and we loved this dog so deeply. And we lost him six to seven weeks ago, and uh, we were sad. We were really sad. We missed this dog. He was an important part of our, our family. And I, you know, in the middle of kind of pan, a pandemic and everything that's going on in our world, you know, a lot of people suffering. I gotta be honest, I didn't know what to do with this emotion that I felt uh, from losing our dog. 
the depression, the sadness, the grief. What do I do with this stuff? And so there was this temptation to just, I want to block it, keep it out. I don't have time for this. Life's too hard as it is. I don't need any more sadness in my life. Or, or, or maybe another strategy is like, well, I'm just going to block it and just hold it and not, not express any of it. I remember I was out in our front yard and I was mowing the lawn and I, I was, I was you know, just doing something to, totally unassociated with the loss of our dog. And I just started to cry. I just started like tears welling up in my eyes as I thought about losing Napoleon. See that, that may feel a little embarrassing at some levels to be mowing your lawn and crying, but this is what emotions are supposed to do. They're supposed to be felt because if we can't feel them, if we can't process them, we can't let them to come in and then roll out, then we're not going to heal. I'm never going to be able to get through the grief unless I feel the emotion of it. If I feel the loss. I've got to embrace that. That's part of the process. So let's, let's look at Jesus. How did he process the emotions that he felt? Well, number one, he prayed. That's a great antidote for any emotion that you are feeling right now is to seek God, to bring it to him. Say, God, right now, I'm really frustrated. God, right now, I am really, really stressed about the future. God, I am really, really worried about our finances. God, I, I am really, really angry at my mom right now for what she did. Uh, God, I, I am overwhelmed with anxiousness and I don't know what to do with it. Bring it to God because that's what Jesus did. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. He knows he's about to be crucified. Just racked with just no, this, this overwhelming emotion of what is to come with the cross and the crucifixion. We see in Luke 22, 44, it says this, and being in anguish, boy, how about that as a feeling? Anguish. And being in anguish, what did Jesus do to process that emotion? He prayed more earnestly. Maybe that's the remedy for you right now. Maybe that is the, the first step for dealing with whatever emotions are going on inside of your heart is to pray more earnestly. Because really what, what we're doing is we're saying, say, God, I'm not going to try to control this. I'm not going to bottle it. I'm not going to block it. I'm going to release it to you and let you heal it. It says, and his sweat Jesus' sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. That's intense emotion. And what does Jesus do? He prays. See, a lot of us make the mistake is when we feel an emotion, we instantly react. We do something. And oft oftentimes when we are overcome with emotions, we do something really stupid, right? I know I've been there. It's like, I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling scared. And how do I react or respond to that emotion is with really stupid stuff. Instead of maybe seeking God and, and praying and seeking his counsel. I did a little doodle to kind of explain this. So this is how most of us work in terms of handling our emotions. We have this event you know, maybe somebody says something really negative to you or something mean to you, or maybe you get a phone call at, at, uh, from your work that just drives you nuts or, or something's happening. There's this event happens and all this emotion is stirred up inside of you. And what do you do? There's the event and then we react. But here's, here's what Jesus does. And this is what I want to encourage you to do is to have that event, whatever that event is and whatever that emotion is that you're feeling to create the pause before you have the reaction. See, because in the pause, that's where real soul work happens. That's where, that's where real spiritual work happens. That's where we are more and more Christ-like in that pause. We don't just feel something and then react. We pause and the pause allows us to choose the best choice, to choose the best choice reaction, to, to align our values and our beliefs with, with this, whatever we're feeling right now and react accordingly. The pause is, is true health in terms of our emotions. And so maybe this week, one of the things you want to try to do is like, 
hey, to be more like Jesus, right? Figure out how to increase the pause, to increase that distance between you feel something and you want to react to it. Maybe your spouse says something that really ticks you off. Or maybe you're like me, your daughter ignores you four times after asking them to do something. I know it's summer vacation, but get out of bed. See, I needed to increase the pause right there. That's how I'm going to be a good father. If I just, if, you know, my frustration and anger and then just react, that's bad parenting. Good parenting, have that same frustration, but create the pause and then I can choose my reaction more, more appropriately. So the first thing, how did Jesus handle his emotions? He prayed, he created time, he created this pause before he reacted to something. The second thing, how did Jesus process emotions? He did this, his emotion moved him to motion. See, when he felt something, he, he did something strategic. He moved. He didn't bottle it up. He didn't just hold on to it. He didn't just ignore it. He, he, it moved him to, to do something, to action. And let me tell you, when we see our society and we see things happening in our society and, and we see injustice, we see people being hurt we, we see things going wrong in our society or we see people taking advantage of, we, we should feel something, right? That is absolutely appropriate. We should be angry when we see injustice. But here's the deal. We don't wanna just, you know, react to it. We, we, we wanna think about it. We wanna have that pause and then we wanna move into action and do something really constructive, doing something that's very helpful, to, to do something that, that is Christ-like. That's where we wanna be. So we want, Jesus allowed his, his emotions to move him into motion, into activity. We find this in Matthew 21, Jesus comes into the temple and they've turned the temple into like eBay. And they're selling all kinds of stuff. And it's like Amazon Prime on steroids here at the temple. And Jesus is like, what are you doing? You, you, you're, you're defiling my father's house. And he's, I'm sure he's frustrated. I'm sure he's angry. I would be I'm like, what is this? And what does he do? Matthew 21, it says this, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. You see, he, go, he didn't just feel some frustration. He didn't feel kind of like, Ugh. he didn't feel that, that anger. I just go, ah, no biggie whatever, just keep doing whatever you're doing. He's like, nope, <laughs> I'm gonna use this emotion and it's gonna drive me to do something that is gonna honor God here. And so he, 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 he knocked over the tables. That's emotion, right? Something's moving there. <laughs> he, he knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. See, Jesus took that emotion and he turned it into motion. You see, when you are frustrated, when you're worried, when you are sad, when you are um, convicted, when you are uh, wanting to do something in our society and you feel all of that, friends, don't block it. Don't bottle it. Be like Jesus, let it drive you forward into something kingdom oriented, a kingdom response. Do something for God with that emotion. Act on it. See, so many of us feel anger and experience that emotion in our lives and different times during the day, or we see something on the news and, and, and we're just like, oh, what do I do with it? You know, so often like our anger undermines us. It, 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 it co-ops our, our, our common sense, it, it causes us to do things we don't really want to do. Like, let, remember this, like use your anger, but don't be used by your anger. There's a big difference there. A sense of allowing this emotion. And, and, and when I feel angry, I create that pause and I can reflect and then I move. I do something with it. Friends, I, I had a... a a guy I was talking to this week and he was telling me about this house that he bought in Chicago and they're new homeowners and uh, they bought it during the winter time. And so when they moved in, the yard was kind of 
dead, basically. Chicago winter, right? <laughs> not, not a lot growing in Chicago in the wintertime. And so he was telling me uh, this week that with spring coming, uh, he, they're discovering a lot of different things about their house and their yard. And he was telling me that there's these different plants and flowers and these tulips that have been, been rising up out of the ground that the previous owners had planted. That they had put there and, 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 and my friend, Mike, he, he didn't know, he didn't know all this was there, but here it's springtime and all of these things are, are rising to the top. I think emotions kind of work that way in our lives. It's like, maybe there's been some things that have been planted along your journey, along your story, maybe in the past couple months in this season. And all of a sudden they're starting to, to give birth, to come out of the ground, to, uh, show themselves. Let me encourage you. Don't ignore it. Don't, don't pretend it's not there. Don't try to cover it up or feel embarrassed that you're feeling these, this way. Don't, don't try to block it. Don't try to bottle it. Don't let your anger use you. Step into it. Feel it. Embrace it, welcome it, but welcome it with Jesus standing by your side and follow his example. Pray about it, release it, surrender it. Create that pause. And then number two, let whatever you're feeling move you in to action. You know, if you're struggling with sadness and depression right now, maybe your, your action is to seek a counselor or a therapist. If you're struggling with anger right now, maybe the, the next step is to find some group where you can help end the injustice in our society. If you're, if you're, if you're really mad at, at your spouse, maybe you need to go and seek some help. Maybe some things are, are showing themselves, different emotions are presenting themselves in this season, just like they were in springtime in Chicago. Things were popping up out of the ground. Friends, don't ignore it. Jesus has a plan for emotions. He wants to dignify whatever you're feeling, but he wants us to move to a place of health, emotional fitness, emotional health, spiritual health, this well-being. Like we can rock this if we begin to embrace it, understand it, not deny whatever we're feeling, and we begin to surrender it to God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. God, thank you so much for feelings for emotions. God, we, we do pray that whatever is stirring in our hearts, that you'll give us guidance and help to begin to process and to release what we weren't meant to hold on to. God, help us to, to slow down and create the pause, to choose our response, to be more Christ-like and, and to do the, the hard soul work of dealing with whatever is going on inside of us right now. And we thank you that you love us, that you care for us, that you know exactly how we feel. It's in your son's name we pray and all of God's people said, amen.
As we continue to navigate 2020, it's so good to see how all of you are continually stepping up to be a light in your community. Check out how Steve Williams is making a difference. I've really come to appreciate Steve. He's demonstrated to us what a child of God can do to help his community, even confined to a wheelchair. This week, CRB Kids made VBS happen in a new venue, your house. We also had some safe social distancing VBS events throughout the week, Sing and Serve where we worshipped and did a service project together, as well as a drive-in celebration at the end of the week. finding new ways to connect while we're still social distancing. Thank you for being good neighbors. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning Oh, I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the water 
holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire Beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I won't bow to the things of this world
I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Thanks for tuning in for Church at Home. Here are a few ways to stay engaged and spiritually connected. We believe giving is an act of worship just like singing, praying, or serving others. Giving is a way to express our love for God. If you're in a position to give, we invite you to visit crb.gives for simple and secure giving. Have you downloaded our app yet? It's for more than just Sunday. Listen to worship music, watch midweek content, and much more. Thanks for watching.